having someone do things that frees you up to have an actual life is going to help your patients. It's going to help your overall family life too. Hi, everyone. We are so glad you're here on Doc Working, the whole physician podcast. I'm Jill Farmer, lead coach at Doc Working. And today I am really excited to talk with an expert on the subject of the hidden workload of women. It is Susan Hyatt, master certified life and business coach, best selling author, TEDx speaker, and the queen of helping women create what they crave in life. She is an expert at helping entrepreneurs and just one of my favorite people. And so Susan, I'm so glad you're here to have this conversation with our physician listeners today. So let's dive right in. What do we mean when we're talking about the hidden workload of women? Well, it's often referred to as the second shift. I often call it the part-time job you didn't know you had. The invisible workload is basically things that women, typically in heterosexual relationships, assume, absorb, just handle because of culture at large and family of origin upbringing. And so women typically handle or shoulder the emotional burden of the family. So managing moods and making sure everyone's okay. But beyond that, you may, Jill, I know you are, be married to the most helpful, most amazing man in the whole world. And still, if we were to measure how much leisure time each of you had and what each of you is handling for the family, we would most of the time find that you had probably five and a half hours less leisure time a week than him. Now, I know you're empty nesters now like I am, and so that may have shifted some, but with raising kids and handling things for the family, it looks like being the one to know when doctor's appointments are happening, knowing where their vaccination charts are, knowing when the pets need to go to the vet, knowing which sippy cup the kid prefers, knowing all sorts of things and being the keeper of all the knowledge is a lot of the invisible workload. Yeah, I love this concept. It kind of blew my mind when I first started reading about it. You defined it perfectly. It's the cognitive and emotional Mm -hmm. labor that Mm -hmm. previously was just kind of unmeasured, right? And I think it Mm -hmm. came out of Harvard research, a PhD at Harvard, when they were sort of comparing workloads, more of the task-oriented things that we were talking about. They would hear a lot of conversations among heterosexual couples talking about, well, I think about the kids a lot more when they're in daycare, or I'm constantly planning ahead for the next thing. And a lot of times the spouses would acknowledge that, but nobody was really measuring what kind of time that Mm -hmm. created. And so I think it's coming more to the forefront and I think it's a powerful awareness. And I think it's going to head us in a different direction as we think about being women in careers and how we integrate work and life. What do you think about that? I definitely think so because If you think about even just the measurement of the leisure gap, I actually think this is conservative, but on average that men have five and a half hours more leisure time than their female counterparts in heterosexual relationships, what would you do with five and a half more hours? And for women, when you consider the wage gap and the confidence gap, and now we've got this leisure gap, like if we can close those gaps, then women can start earning more, you know, have more time to do what matters to them. And stop burning ourselves out and having serious health consequences because we're doing everything for everyone. And I know from my own personal experience and also with client experiences that when my children were little, like you, I hadn't ever heard of this. And so I couldn't quite articulate when I would say, I'm doing so much more. My very helpful husband would say, but I'm doing, and he would list all these things. And I just didn't have the words to explain the cognitive and emotional labor. And now I do. And boy, is he (laughs) getting all the education now. Even over the holidays, we invited his extended family over for a holiday meal. This is a tiny example, but it proves the point that the morning up, he came to me and said, I really want to help. And so can you give me my list so I can get my list done for you? And I said, okay. 
I love that you want to help, but I just want to point out that the assumption is you're helping me. Like, this is my thing. And secondly, I'm the keeper of the list. Like, you aren't sure what to do unless I make you the list. Now, I appreciate you want to do whatever I put on the list, but that is the invisible workload at play. And he was just like, okay, but can I have the list? Can you just like give it to me? And so I think that for people listening who will say, oh, no, not in my household, you know, my husband cooks or my husband picks up the kids. We're not saying that men are getting up in the morning trying to be as unhelpful as possible and keep you down. What we're saying is like, this is the patriarchy and a system that we've all bought into. And now it's time to become awake to these gaps and start closing them. Absolutely. And I think that's important for our listeners. You can be like you and I are, you know, proud feminists who definitely Mm -hmm. believe in equality between genders and have had this baked into my bones, right? Yeah, and so yeah. this stuff comes out in ways that is not intentional, right? Or sometimes is a gap between the knowing and doing, right? Mm-hmm. I know I want equality between genders and still mm-hmm. I feel like I am judged more if there's a meal at our house or if somebody pops in at my house and it's a mess more <laughs> as a woman right. than my mm-hmm. spouse is going to be. A lot of this plays into for physicians and for physician clients into a concept that I first learned from my friend Bridget Schulte's book a number of years ago, Overwhelmed, which is contaminated time. And this notion Mm. that women a lot of times have less of a luxury of having their work time specifically in a container that's not contaminated by either thoughts, worries, emotions, again, that cognitive and emotional labor that Mm. we have in the invisible workload. And their time at home completely that is just for doing things that someone might want to do at home, whether that's parenting or related to the household. And so I think a lot of my physician clients, and then after we did a podcast on contaminated time, I heard from some physician listeners are like, you know, I just never thought about it that way, but no wonder I'm so exhausted if I'm at work and still worrying about you know, what's happening at daycare, whether somebody remembered all the pieces of equipment that they needed for the stuff that's afterwards. And then when I'm at home, it's hard for me to turn off, you know, that I'm thinking about that particular case, you know, how it's presenting, waiting for the lab work to come in. And so how do you see that notion of contaminated time kind of playing into the issue of the invisible workload of women? First of all, I love that phrase. I wrote it down. I'm going to have to read that book because that's exactly what it is, is contaminated time. And so for women, right, I was telling the story yesterday that my children now are 23 and 21 and my 23-year-old son, Ryan, was consistently, the principal and the teachers had me on speed dial. Let's just say that. And up until he was in the fifth grade, I was the first point of contact for the school. So I would be going about my day, coaching clients, doing all the things and fielding phone calls from the school and needing to resolve whatever was happening. And when he reached fifth grade, I handed that over to my husband and changed the main point of contact at the school to Mr. Scott Hyatt. And I was like, you can get these calls now and have your workday interrupted and figure out solutions throughout the day. And so in essence, I noticed how contaminated my workday was with solving those kinds of problems and decided to reassign that. But beyond that, yes, like no matter what a woman is doing during the day, we have assumed the role because that's what we're taught and trained to do about thinking ahead. You know, oh, when I pick them up from school, I'm going to need to have snacks. Oh, and they're going to be upset that soccer's canceled. And so I'm going to need to. And it's all of this accommodating that we're thinking about and ruminating on planning ahead for our own safety, and <laughs> mental health. Like, let me go ahead and make everything great for everyone. And that is exhausting. So it's like, what if, you know, you pick them up and let them feel their feelings. What if you're not the one trying to buffer and manage everyone's emotions every moment of the day? What if you just let people experience life and not try to soften everything for everyone except yourself? Yeah, that's really thought provoking. And I think that leads us into 
the solutions, right? And mm-hmm. it isn't a, here's a checklist of three ways <clears throat> to completely eradicate the invisible workload of women. I mean, we're not trying to play in that game, but as coaches, we do. Susan and I both like to think about, let's identify the challenge and then let's look for solutions. And that's the first solution is to identify the challenge yes. and awareness, yes. right? Oh, I didn't know there was a five and a half hour leisure gap. And I can tell you from all the research, and we've talked about it on the podcast many times before, burnout happens when we don't change the channel in our brain and stop working and take time to refill or refuel our tanks. And so that gap is real and will make you burn out faster as a female physician. The gap is real. 40% of female physicians (laughs) within the first eight years of practicing medicine are significantly cutting back or leaving the practice of medicine. That's not because people are lazy or not willing to work very, 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 very hard. It's at least partly because women are trying to be superhuman and we can't, that's not sustainable when we want to have gender equality in the practice of medicine. So I'm passionate about this. So I, yes, Mm. love identification of Mm -hmm. the problem and then being aware of it so that you can start to take some other steps. Another step that I think has to happen is that women have to, especially our physicians, because you're so highly capable, the curse of the highly capable person is to think that you should just do everything because you might as well, because you can do it often better than other people. Mm -hmm. Female physicians have to be willing to let other people help. What do you have to say about that? A hundred percent. And I have been guilty of this because a lot of the pushback that women get when they do, and that is the first step going through your day and identifying all the things that you think are your part-time job that maybe you don't have to be the one to do. And when presented to a spouse or partner, just know that spouses, even helpful ones can get defensive because it's the first time they're becoming aware of this. And then what they typically will say, and my husband said to me is like, but you don't like how I do it. I won't do it how you want, and I won't do it when you want. And so it's being able to say, okay, like here's the baseline expectations and have at it and let go of needing it to be done perfectly and be done the way that you want it done. Yeah, I think that's excellent. And also recognizing that maybe everything can't be done by you and your spouse. And, Mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of pressure that good, frugal, hardworking people and, you know, medical education is so grueling that physicians coming out of the, on the other side of medical education, they have the hard work and the overwork part down pat to the point where sometimes they don't realize that a lot of the rest of the world ain't working that hard. (laughs) Right, right, right. And there's some big benefits that can come from not overworking to that level. And one of the ways to do that is to offload or delegate by paying someone else to do things that maybe as a child, your mom did, if you're a woman, sometimes if you're the offspring of physicians, maybe she did have to do it all because the options weren't there in the same way, but that doesn't mean that you need to do it all. And I really spend a lot of time, especially with my physician clients who are parents, trying to get them to think about ways that they can offload or delegate or pay someone else besides even just their spouse to do stuff. Let me tell you something, you're bringing up something amazing and absolutely create the budget for it because I'm an empty nester and I have a personal assistant who like all the part-time job stuff, that's what she does. That's absolutely what she does. And it frees up my time to write my next book and have time to sit and do nothing, right? Like you were saying before, burnout is real and you must offload this stuff. You're absolutely right, Jill. It doesn't have to be you or your spouse. It can be someone paid to help. Yeah, I know. And I know that the initial startup for that can feel overwhelming, particularly if you're somebody who feels like you're firing on all cylinders, but it's worth it, right? The juice is worth the squeeze on that one. It's worth Mm -hmm. training somebody who you trust and finding somebody who can drive your kids so that you don't have that Mm -hmm. time in the car and it can be better spent doing other things or doing your laundry, even if it's different than the person who cleans your house and takes care Mm -hmm. of your kids. A lot of times there's this hidden rule that physicians will have for themselves. Like, well, I already have a nanny. So therefore Mm -hmm. I'm getting help and not understanding that really, this is a very taxing career and it does require some emotional and cognitive labor outside the actual, you know, nobody's just working as a physician for eight hours. (laughs) in the clinic or in the hospital or in that setting. And so given that there needs to be some give and take in the rest of the workload that you're taking on outside of your actual work duties. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, listen, times have changed and the world has changed. 
But what women ended up doing was going to work full time and handling everything else that women were expected to handle as well. And that has to change. It has to for our mental and our physical health. And so you have to think about that having someone do things that frees you up to have an actual life is going to help your patients. It's going to help your overall family life too. Yeah. And it makes this all more sustainable into the future. So we've talked about awareness and just understanding and knowing better. We've talked about communicating more clearly, really taking a look. I think you said at what you are doing every single day and looking at where you can divide it more evenly and where there's just Mm -hmm. been a lot of taking things on without awareness, making room for some perhaps messy and even a little bit of conflict with the spouse or partner as Mm -hmm. you're reallocating some of these, looking for outside help to help support you understanding that you are taking on a lot of this mental time and energy in that cognitive emotional labor as part of this. What else do our women physician listeners and our male physician listeners need to understand about the invisible workload of women to help turn the ship in a different direction as we're moving forward? That change can happen, Mm -hmm. that it's not just, oh, this is how it is and changing your mindset around it, that you don't have to do things the way they've always done, that you can make meaningful change and that you can benefit and deserve to benefit from that change. And my hope is that my granddaughters read about things like this and think like, wow, that was a thing. Like grandma dealt with that. You know, my highest intention is that everyone listening to this will just go be a journalist in their own life and pay attention to what's happening and make a list and just start creating solution focused plans. And I think that's a great idea. I have participated in panels with physicians in the last year, and I'm noticing such a change of people being willing to be more honest and a little bit vulnerable Mm -hmm. about these kinds of experiences and understanding the concepts and the research, but also naming how it shows up in their own lives and their own experiences. That's part of the way I think that we pave the way for change. And Mm -hmm. I'm with you. I think it's a hundred percent possible once we have the awareness and, you know, we're willing to get a little uncomfortable with some of these conversations and the idea that we don't need to be perfect all the time. I'm excited right. about the future. Now that we know better, we can do better. Yes. Any other final thoughts, Susan, and how can people get a hold of you if they want to check out the amazing work that you put into the world? My final thought is don't just listen to this podcast episode and say, that's interesting and move on. I really want to challenge everyone listening to this, like, get fired up, close that leisure gap. And if you want some more help closing the leisure gap, you can check me out. If you're on Instagram at Susan Hyatt, my website is shyatt.com. I'm also on Facebook and all the places. So that's where I hang out and I'm delighted to help anybody. It's been wonderful having you here. Thank you so much for joining us in this conversation. I love all my conversations with you, but particularly (laughs) this one and this subject matter is near and dear to both of our hearts. Today's episode was brought to you by Doc Working Thrive, which is a subscription-based coaching program just for physicians. And we have coaching support. We have peer support. It is a fantastic community. And if you're feeling burnout and tired and like you need to make a shift, go to docworking.com right now and check out Doc Working Thrive. Tell your friends about us. We can't wait to see you next time on Doc Working, the whole physician podcast. Until then, I'm Jill Farmer. I'm Amanda Taran, producer of Doc Working, the Whole Physician podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and head over to DocWorking.com to see all we have to offer.